Research indicates that one of two adult women in the United States will be abused sometime during her life. Dr. Lenore Walker has worked with abused women for more than 20 years, developing an approach to treating victims of sexual, physical, and psychological abuse called survivor therapy. Survivor therapy integrates principles from feminist therapy and trauma theory, and it draws on techniques from those as well as other treatment models. Survivor therapy directly addresses the changes in affect, cognition, and behavior that trauma can cause. Often, these psychological changes are coping strategies for avoiding further abuse. To help the client go from being a victim to becoming a survivor, two goals are essential. First, we must help her become safe. And second, we must help her reestablish her own sense of personal power. An essential tenet of this treatment approach is for the therapist to take care not to blame the victim for being abused. Now let's begin. Sarah is a 36-year-old woman who lives with her husband, Dan, her 11-year-old daughter, Abby, and her 9-year-old son, Justin. She works at home as a part-time computer graphics consultant. Sarah was referred to me by her daughter's psychologist, who was concerned that Dan might be battering Sarah. So I thought maybe we could start with you just giving me some idea of what brings you here. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's my daughter Abby has been having some some problems, and so when I talked to Dr. Kelly, we thought that it might be something that's happening at home, and mm -hmm. I've noticed that I have been. My husband and I have been fighting a lot more the last couple of months, and I, I want to try to learn how I can make it better at home, so that's why I'm here. Okay, let's talk a little bit about it. Tell me a little bit about what's happening with Abby, and if it's okay with you, I want to take some notes. Sure. Okay, sure. Uh, when I suspect a new client is being battered, but she doesn't identify the abuse, I let her describe the presenting problem the way she sees it. I also like to ask permission before I take notes to establish that she has certain rights here in therapy. And it, she's even quit gymnastics, which she loves, and she doesn't want to go at all. And I've really noticed that, I mean, when she got used to get home from school, she would come in and we would talk and talk about her day, and she would sometimes help me with dinner, and, and we'd have a really nice time. But now she just briefly says hello and, and goes straight up to her room. She's, she spends so much time in her room, I, just really withdrawn. Just, mm -hmm. It really worries me. And you think there may be some tie together between some fighting at, in the house? Tell me a little bit about that. That's the only thing I can think of. Uh, just been a little bit more tension and, and some fights between my husband and I. What's your husband's name? Dan. Okay. Dan, and uh, I don't know, he just is, he, he gets very jealous and, and sometimes just, I, I think, you know, he's also under a lot of pressure at work and there's just been some times when I haven't been able to, I guess, keep up on some of the things at home um, because I've been taking a little bit more work myself now that the kids are in school and... What kind of work? I do some computer work. Mm -hmm. At home? Yes, mostly, but um, like two days a week I'll, I'll go in every now and then, but mostly at home. Uh -huh. Tell me, if you can, what the last fight is that you can remember about. It's important to give clients a clear um, message that it's acceptable to talk about abuse. Well, I was, I was in the kitchen, I was on the phone, um, talking to this guy at work, um, and he was having some difficulty with this new software program, and he had called me, he was really desperate, really needed my help. So I was talking to him, going through it with him to try to get him started, and Dan was in the room and he was doing some work on some of his papers and I can just tell that he was he was really upset by the way he was slamming down his briefcase and, and just the way he was moving and so I thought it would probably be best for me to get off the phone and I told Kevin, this guy, that 
that I would just come in when the kids were at school and I would help him then and to get off the phone, but it's really a bad move because that set Dan off. This incident holds some important clues that this is a battering relationship. Dan demonstrates extreme jealousy, and his response suggests that he feels he's entitled to Sarah's attention 100% of the time, and that he has the right to punish her if he doesn't get it. He just he told me that I was a whore and you know, just stuff like that, and it was just escalating. It was getting more angry and I was trying to calm him down. I really tried to calm him down and explain to him what was going on and, and the more I tried to explain, the worse it got. And he, he just, he lost it and he started coming after me with this ballpoint pen, so... It may I be tempting to suggest that Sarah stay off the phone when Dan is home, but this would be a short-term solution at best. Batterers usually continue to pursue their need for power and control in other ways. <sighs> I just tried to drown him out, so I put my hands up to my ears, which is really stupid because he hates it when I, when I don't listen to him, when he's not being listened to. So he yelled at me and, and said that he, he told me that you know, I, I should never leave it. He told me that I should never run away from him like that and that, that he'd teach me to listen to him, so he, he twisted my hands off my ears and and said oh, I'll I'll teach you how to listen you bitch and and slammed his hands onto my ears show me how he did it um I just like that really hard was it really hard yeah yeah it, it hurt mm -hmm. did you need any kind of medical attention no no I did not I was I was just dizzy I couldn't I couldn't get up very much well and it, well, my left ear, I couldn't hear out for a while, but I, I know I was fine. <laughs> Although Sarah is very clear about see, reporting the details, she minimizes the severity of the abuse. Like Minimization is a typical coping strategy used to avoid re-experiencing the high levels of anxiety that come from abuse. Things like that happened before? Like, like hurt him hurting you? Yeah. Yeah. Can you remember the first time something like that might happen? It's important to take a detailed abuse history as part of the initial assessment. I usually ask for four battering incidents. The first one she can remember, a typical one, the worst, and one of the most recent. I was... It was probably when I was... Uh, we were first married, and... I, I hadn't been feeling too well, um, and so I wasn't, I wasn't able really to do the housework, and some things had sort of fallen behind. I, I hadn't vacuumed for a while, and one of my best friends was having a baby shower, and I really wanted to go, and so I um, thought that I had felt well enough, and it was that night, and so I planned on going, and I'd gotten ready, and Dan had asked me where I was going to be going, and, and when I told him, he, he just really got... He got very upset, and said that if I wasn't well enough to clean the house and take care of things at home, that I certainly wasn't well enough to be going out to any old baby shower. And he grabbed me. He, he grabbed me and, and drug me down the hall and threw me into the bedroom and said that if I was sick, I had to stay in bed. And sort of kept me in my room. So you couldn't go? No. But, I mean, I, I probably should have spent the time cleaning the house, you know, getting things ready before I, I left. I just didn't quite have the energy to do everything, so I thought that maybe I could do it the next mm -hmm. day, but I probably should have finished. 
Although Sarah has made a number of self-blaming statements, it's too early to confront them now. But I'll make a note I mean, to address I, them I, later. I should have spent the time finished. Tell me what the very worst thing was that Dan's ever done to you in all the time you've been together. Very worst that you can think of. <coughs> I know this is hard, but it'll give me an idea a little bit in a short period of time of what life is really like for you. Well, I guess a couple of weeks ago, um, we were going out to dinner with the, some friends. I had met her at a bus stop. It was really nice to get to know her because she was the only other person that stayed at home during the day. Mm -hmm. And. And this is the first time that we had ever gone out together, and we went downtown. And um, Dan had dropped us off. We had a really lovely time. But <laughs> we all sort of drank a little bit too much. Dan especially had a lot to drink. And when we were leaving, um, we were walking back to the car, and it was kind of in a bad neighborhood. It, Mm -hmm. Not really good, and we had passed by this. Um, we had passed by this uh, an adult video store, and Dan just sort of um, was going off on all these pictures that he was seeing, really making all these comments and really embarrassing me mm -hmm. and embarrassing them mm -hmm. um, and I was just you know really trying to get him to to leave and to come and and, and he got this um this look in his eye that and he dashed into the video store just leaving you on the street yeah I couldn't look at my friends in the eye I, I was so like Sarah, many battered women identify humiliation as the worst form of abuse, worse even than specific acts of physical and sexual violence. Finally, Dan comes out waving this bag, um, and he, he grabbed me around the shoulders and started taking me down the sidewalk. and. He um, just started saying that <laughs> that I really enjoyed being um, roughed around, and he pulled out all this pair of handcuffs and started waving them around and laughing and and joking and and saying, "Go ahead and beg me for it, beg." Beg me to give it to you rough tonight, and and saying that I enjoyed having it done that way, and and laughing and and trying to get me to to beg him, and um, I just was pleading with him. I just said, Dan, please don't do this. And he said, just beg me, beg me to give it to you rough tonight. And he put the handcuffs on and went up to this car, it wasn't our car, and said he was going to hand me to the, handcuff me to the uh, car unless I begged him. And I didn't know how to make him stop. He was so drunk. And, I mean, I suppose I shouldn't have let him drink so much, but I couldn't stop him. And, and so I begged him. I begged him, and I just wanted him to stop. But he didn't stop. 
all these awful things. What did you do, Sarah? <laughs> Can you talk about it? I was just, just up in bed. Sex? Yeah. I won't go into the details of the sexual abuse today because Sarah's level of emotional intensity is already high enough for the first session. Mm -hmm. Sounds awful. This can be a difficult moment in therapy. Many therapists find it painful to listen to the details of abuse, particularly sexual violence. It's important to let the client know that it's safe to re-experience these painful feelings in the therapy session. Empathic listening and my confidence that this is part of the healing process will help us both get through the tough times. Um, is it getting worse? Uh, uh, yes, I think they are. Mm -hmm. He's so stressed out with work. He's got a huge project coming up and I just haven't been able to spend, I think, the amount of time just being there for him because I've taken on a few projects also and... Sarah, do you think that this is your fault? Oh, I think I have a lot to do with it, yeah, I, I do. I think it's a... Do you want him to hurt you that way? Oh, no. So why is it your fault? Well, it's a two-way street. I mean, I'm sure that I provoke him at times. There are things that I do that... Well, I'm sure you do some things, but do you think the kinds of things that you do deserve what you just described to me? Well, n no, I don't think that it deserves no, that. It doesn't deserve it, no matter what you do. At this point, it's too early to know if Sarah's statement is indicative of self-blame or if she really plays a part in the escalation of the violence that needs to be changed. In order to avoid any misconceptions that she is to blame, I emphasize that violence is never justified. I'm not I mean, he's not really an abusive person. He's. You know, I'm not saying he's an abusive person, because I don't know Dan. And I, I mean, but what I'm saying to you is that what you're describing to me is being you're being abused. That's abusive behavior, battering behavior. And you don't deserve it. Well. <laughs> I, I mean, he's such a, he's, he can be such a great man. Tell me about some of the nice times. Sarah's recovery after recounting oh, the painful that? details of the abuse and really demonstrates so resiliency and emotional strength. Really I don't want to pass judgment on Dan as a person, so I limit my comments to his behavior. Although I'm trying to get Sarah to look at the abuse in a different way, that's too difficult for her right now. Instead, I'll respond to her need to tell me about Dan's positive qualities. This will help strengthen our therapeutic alliance, and it will help me understand what keeps her in the relationship. Um, uh, one time, he, uh, to surprise me, he had, um, he had bought all these lilac bushes, and we it filled the, like, the, the family room with them when I came down, and we, we spent like the whole day just together, planting them in the yard and, and spending time together. It was really lovely. Had this happened <laughs> after there was a fight? Was there a fight right before that? Um, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so this made you feel better? Well, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. um, he was sort of making up, I guess, in his way. So he knows when he's, he's gone too far, when you're really upset, and he'll do something to make you feel better? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. he's always so sweet afterwards. He can be so just really sweet. Mm -hmm. Does Justin and, and Abby, do they get involved sometimes in some of the fights? <coughs> um, I, I know they're affected by it. They Do they see it? Do they hear it? Yeah. 
Yeah, they do. I mean, Which? They do see, they see some. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I know that they do hear when, I mean, when we're yelling at each other, they, they mm -hmm. the house isn't that big. Do you yell at him, at Dan, or does Dan do most of the yelling? <sighs> Dan does most of the yelling. I, I really try to keep him calm. Mm -hmm. But I, I get angry every now and then. And, and I mean, I probably should try to. It's not good when I do. It just gets worse. Mm -hmm. So I really try to stay as calm as I can. Do the children ever get involved in a fight? Research shows that as many as 60% of men who batter their partners also batter their children. I'll do a more thorough assessment for child abuse later in consultation with Abby's therapist. So it sounds like everybody's paying a lot of attention to Dan's needs. I wonder if maybe one of the reasons why Abby might run away to her room is because this is getting um, difficult for her. Uh, that, that could be. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought of that. What would you like to see happen? Uh, if you home. came, yeah. If you, well, if you if you were to come here and work with me, um, what would you like to be different? Want um, me to fix Dan, make him all better? Yeah, <laughs> I guess it would. I mean, if I could learn how to stop the fighting, then I would be happy about that. Yes, that was what. That's what I would like. Well, I got some good news and bad news. <laughs> <laughs> the bad news is that there's no way that I can help Dan stop his fighting or stop his abusive behavior. Only Dan can do that. The good news is that I can help you try and figure out what you want to do about all of it. Yeah, I guess if I could figure out how to, you know, stop it and smooth it, that would be good. That uh -huh. would be what I... You can't I, stop it. Well, what I, mean, I can my, do... <laughs> my, you know, I'm sure my reactions, if I can learn how to minimize it then mm -hmm. maybe we can help you find ways to make yourself more safe but we'll have to know more about you um, as a person to be able to do that but we can't stop Dan's fighting you he is battering you and that we can't stop I, I'm not a battered woman I'm not I'm not a battered wife Denial, minimization, repression, and dissociation are frequently seen in battered women. They serve as healthy coping responses to protect the woman from her overwhelming reactions to the abuse. What do you think about when I say that? What kind of situation do you think about? Um, that TV show, The Burning Bad. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think, I think of all these other stories. I mean, mm -hmm. the stories I hear, they're so horrendous, they're so awful. It's like, I mean, I'm not in that situation. Mm -hmm. Well, what, so. what do you, how do you call when somebody hits you, and, um, hits you on the head, chases you, chases after you, gets handcuffs, forces you to have sex when you don't want to have sex? If I told you that about somebody well, else, what wrong, would you say? So, I mean, there's, there's, mm -hmm. I think there's things that... Uh, do you really think that I'm a battered woman? Yes, I do. I really do think you're a battered woman. You know, I have a lot of clients that I work with who have been battered, and they describe things just the way you do, Sarah. The simple act of naming the abuse can be therapeutic in itself. Telling the client that she is like other women who have been abused can reduce her feelings of isolation and shame. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. And I don't think that the abuse is your fault. But I think there are some things that if you want to work together in therapy, and I'd love to work with you, that we could do that could really help you look at things maybe a little bit differently and maybe really feel better about what your life is about. Is that something you think you might want to do? I would like to do that. One of the basic principles of survivor therapy is that the goals are negotiated mutually. This models egalitarian aspects of the relationship and focuses attention on the power dynamics. How about if, for the next time that we meet together, uh -huh. you do a little bit of thinking during the week. And what I'd like you to think about 
is what you would really like your life to be like. If you could design a life for you, what would you like it to be like? And I'm going to give you three times. What would you like it to be like now, right now? Uh -huh. What would you like it to be like in a couple of months, let's say? Maybe three months or so. And then what would you be like maybe a couple of years from now? What would you like to be doing then? How would you like your life to look like? And if you could do a little thinking about that and then bring that in next week, we'll start to talk a little bit more about that. Okay. Okay. Great. A lethality checklist can be a useful tool in assessing the potential for serious harm or death. Although it's very difficult to predict the escalation of violence, in Sarah's case, the risk appeared low. Nevertheless, I gave Sarah a list of community resources, including the local battered women's shelter, in case the violence escalated. My initial diagnosis is a post-traumatic stress disorder with battered woman syndrome as a subcategory. Although she didn't exhibit all the necessary criteria in the first session, later on she did demonstrate the intrusive memories, the high anxiety or high arousal symptoms, and high avoidance or numbing symptoms that are required by the DSM-4. The second session was devoted to continuing to gather further details of her history and to the concept of a safety plan. Her homework was to develop a preliminary escape plan. That's great, Sarah. Um, where do fights usually start? Show me that. Oh, usually in the kitchen, which is this right here. Because mm -hmm. um, I spend I, most of my time roots in here, and mm -hmm. that's usually where I'm either on the phone or... Where's the phone? The phone is on this, so it's right here. But it has a long cord so that I can move around pretty easily. Uh -huh. It's important for Sarah to generate the plan herself, rather than me suggesting what she should do. Later in therapy, I may be faced with moments when I have to step back and let the client lead, even if I disagree with her choices. Great. Now, if he were to start, think about a fight where he really started something and you were just in that position, let's say you were on the phone and he was sitting in there. So how would you get out? Draw it, maybe draw it with the pencil. If Let's say you're standing there, here. and he starts, you're on the phone, he's sitting there, and you're starting to get, where do you feel it when you start getting a little nervous, like, you know? Right here. Okay, right, right here. here. So now, can you feel it? Right here? Yeah. All right, now you're getting nervous. What would you do if you wanted to start to walk out? Yeah. Without talking to him, without looking at him, what route would you take there? It is often possible to use the concept of time out, but it has to be employed early before the abuser's anger escalates. Mm -hmm. If Sarah can learn to recognize the physical signs of her anxiety, she can learn to act sooner to protect herself. I, if I needed to get out or away, mm -hmm. I would just come over here. There's an, a door right there. Okay, now remember last week when we were talking about this, we talked about the need for you to get out and have things ready for you? Right, right. And this, I think, would be the best place to go. Mm -hmm. um, the carport is right here. Okay. The car. And I could, go, I could go out this direction very easily. Now, where do you usually keep your, your car keys in your purse? Yeah, I keep them in my purse, and he's got He's got um, his keys, too. Mm -hmm. But what if you couldn't get your purse? I thought of that. Okay, <laughs> what'd you do? I actually got an extra pair. I, I made a spare, spare hand. These are, um, put one in the planter that's right out here. Good for you. Yeah. That's great. So you've got that part all set up. Yeah. Very good. Now, did you talk to the children? Do the, do the kids know that if you were to go out, do they know where to meet you if you wanted them to leave? Did you arrange a signal yet? No, I didn't. I didn't okay. do that. Okay, so you think about that. You don't have to do that right away, but think about that just in case you need to. I'll let Sarah take her time with this because both Abby's psychologist and I feel that the risk of abuse to the children is very low at this time. Okay, now what I want you to do with this is I want you to 
when you go home, I want you to rehearse how you would get out. And what I want you to remember is that feeling up here. So that when you start to feel that way, you know it's time to leave. Don't wait for anything more to happen. Just go out so that Dan is not going to start to block you. Mm -hmm. You don't think that would make him angrier that I, like, not just leave the house, but get in the car and go? Well, now we talked about that last week, and you were saying you thought you could tell him that if he really starts to make you very upset that you were going to leave, you'd come back again and talk to him when things calm down, but that you were going to leave. Yeah. So you haven't done that yet? No. Okay. <laughs> I haven't. All right. Well, when you're ready to do that, we'll, we'll talk about how to do it. But what I want you to do now is I want you to rehearse it. So I want you to actually physically walk there. Put yourself in that position and walk there. So that you see how long it takes, how you would walk, all those little details. Think you can do that? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. It's good work. We really are, are paying attention to that, and that's really important uh, for you. Thanks. I went in to go see Justin's teacher the other day because mm -hmm. he's been having some uh, problems himself and <sighs> made Dan furious. He got really upset with me. He said, I've made Abby crazy. I'm not going to make Justin crazy too. And he just laid into me and said that having two shrinks in the family is not going to have three. In fact, he even told me that he's going to stop paying for this after the insurance runs out next week. And, uh, I just don't know what I'm going to do. An abusive partner will frequently react to the woman's growing strength by trying to sabotage the therapy, often by refusing to pay for it. I mean, if I take on more work, I really can't take on more work because that's, I won't be there for the kids. They've got to have me there after school and when they're, and I know that it just frustrates Dan and it makes everything so much more tents in the house, and I just don't know if that's, I, I just don't think that's an option. Mm -hmm. What would happen if you took on more work? I would not probably get the stuff done at home that Dan wants to have done. Um, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be there when Abby and Justin get home from school. Mm -hmm. And even uh, if you worked in the house? Well, there's only a certain amount that I can do in the home. Mm -hmm. And even if I'm, I, I'm, no, I'm just not, uh, I mean, what would happen if you just weren't there for a little bit? It would be, it would be horrendous. It would be just like, it would be just like when I was a kid. My mother was never there, and it was mm -hmm. awful. And, and I, that's the whole reason why they got divorced, is because she was never around. She was never at home. And... It, if I'm not, th I know that's exactly what's going to happen. If I, if I go out to work and I'm not there, then we're going to be out on the street and I know that Dan is just going to be, he's not going to have anything to do with this. And it's just like... Sarah's catastrophizing tells me that we have hit a raw nerve here. We won't address her irrational beliefs now because the issue of commitment to therapy must first be renegotiated. And I've got to have them whoa. around. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, do you hear where you're going with this? I'm going... Now, the, now, we were just talking about a couple of hours extra work, and now you've got yourself on the street. But I'm not going to be there. I'm not, I mean, a couple of hours extra work a week is not going to help my financial situation that much. I know that it's going to turn into being more and more and more. All right, let's, let's stop for a minute. Just stop for a second. Do you want to stay in therapy? This is also a decision point for Sarah. Our relationship is deepening, permitting us to work on a more intense level. This can frighten some clients, and they may terminate therapy at this time. You have to for you. Is this something you want to do? And then let's see if we can't problem solve it. Yes, I, I do, but I just don't know if it's worth it. I In mean, what way? Well, what it's it's causing so much anxiety, right? Now, is it the finance that's worrying you, or are you really getting scared that Dan is getting more and more upset? 
I mean, I guess he, he gets really angry whenever I come. Mm -hmm. And is his anger starting to make you more scared? Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it does. It <sighs> does therapy help you deal with that any better? It helps me to be able to come and talk to you mm -hmm. about how I'm feeling and what's going on with my kids. Are you feeling stronger inside as a person? Yes. Yes, I am. I am. And that may be part of what's happening with Dan, is that he may be seeing that you're getting stronger inside. And that may be why he's giving you a harder time about coming to therapy. Oh. <laughs> I've never thought about that. Yeah. Well, let's talk about how you might be able to pay for it. I don't know. Maybe what you did say about trying to take on some work at home so that I can still be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can ask them. I can ask them if what kinds of things that I can be away mm -hmm. from the office and still do. This is an important moment for Sarah. Rather than looking to me, her family, or to Dan, she's taking responsibility for her own situation. Oh. Well, a lot of it is really fun. I, en I enjoy the computer graphics. I, mm -hmm. I enjoy figuring out how to make those work and, and creating. It's, there's a certain amount of creativity that is in that, and I like that part. There's, there's so much out there that I would love to learn, but I know a little bit. Mm-hmm. Bet you know more than a little. <laughs> I, I'm you know, it good is, at what I do. It is okay to pat yourself on the back when you do something <laughs> right. Well, I'm pretty good. <laughs> do you know how your whole face lights up when you talk about something you really like to do? No. It does. Yeah? It really does. You know, a lot of what we talked about today has really made you very upset. You seem like you get more nervous, more anxious. Are you doing this more now than you have in the past? Being more anxious? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I am. Would you like to learn some techniques that might be able to help you relax a little bit more when you start to feel this way? Yeah, sure. I'd, I'd like that. Okay, one of the, the techniques I want to teach you is called relaxation training. And I'm going to teach you how to make your body feel more relaxed. As we focus on the reality of the abuse, the defenses Sarah has used for many years, including minimization and denial, become less effective in managing her anxiety. Relaxation training gives her another choice. Good. Feel how tight that feels? Now hold it. In a typical battering cycle, a period of tension building escalates to an acute battering incident. This is followed by a period of loving contrition that reinforces the woman's belief that the man will stop his abuse. However, without intervention, the cycle of violence usually begins again, leading to further abuse. Sarah. Hi, Lenore. How you doing? Doing okay. Great. Yeah, good. That's good. You know, I made a note that this session I wanted to start with checking up with you on if you've done the rehearsal of the safety plan that we've been talking about now for the last few weeks. Yeah. Uh, no, I haven't. <laughs> hmm. Not yet. Huh? No, I... What's going on? Well, I, I, actually, I just don't think it's going to be that much that important anymore right now. I, things are so much better at home, Lenore. They're, ever since I came here, things have gotten so much better. Hmm. Tell me about it. Well, Dan's just not as angry anymore. I think coming here has really helped our relationship at home. My being able to come and talk to you about my problems. I don't stress him out. 
-hmm. and I'm able to be there for him when he needs me. He's under, he's been under so much stress with this new project I was telling you about. Just my being able to be there has been so, and, and open to him, not having to take my problems in or talking to him about any of these kind of stressful things. He's able to, it's just gotten so much better. He's um, hmm. nicer all the time and, and just things are, are a little bit more positive. So you're looking pretty chipper about all this. I, I am. I feel really great. Oh, Dan the other night, he, he mentioned that we should get out of town, that, that we needed just some time together. As he feels the woman pulling away, a batterer will frequently use loving behavior to seduce her back into his control. So we're going to go up to um, the, a mountain home that his boss owns and just sort of get away from everything. So that's what I need to tell you. I need to reschedule one of my appointments. Even though she's lived through these cycles many times, Sarah wants to believe that this time he really means sure. it. Sure, but let me ask you a question about that. Uh -huh. What do you know about this mountain home? Well, I've been there once before. Uh-huh. Is yeah. it, where is it? Is, are there lots of people around? Is it in a when I believe the client's safety is directly at risk, I take a very active role. There are a few, a few other cabins around and, and I don't know how many people will be up there, but th no, there, should be, mm -hmm. there should be people up there at this time. You feel okay about going that far away from home with them? Oh, I'm looking so forward to it. Yeah, I do. What I would do. you do if you were up there and you were all alone and Dan started getting angry with you? Have you thought about that? Mm, no. I don't want to be a wet blanket. I don't want to throw, you know, cold water on this because this sounds like it might be fun. But let's yeah. think about some of the ideas of things that you could do just to make sure that you're safe. <coughs> well, anybody have a telephone? Oh, well, yeah, they do have a telephone. Uh-huh. And a telephone number that works? Yeah, I, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. I haven't called it, but... So could you, do you think you could give that telephone number to some people? You know, like maybe the I person, could, who, who's going to take care of the kids? My sister is. I could mm -hmm. give it to my sister. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could you make sure she calls you a couple of times and have like a pre-range signal with her? I'm very concerned about Sarah going away with Dan to a secluded place. She is resistant to the idea that Dan's anger could escalate to a dangerous level. I'll use our relationship to get her to develop a safety plan. Well, I would feel a whole lot better if I knew that you would make a safety plan. Do you think you could do it? Yeah, I can do that, Lenore. Thanks. Okay, that would be good. Sarah did develop a safety plan for her trip to the mountains. Fortunately, the weekend went well, and she didn't have to use it. Sarah, how you doing? Fine. Guess what? What? I got a call from a marketing research group the other night, uh -huh. and they want me to work two days a week in their office to do a multimedia program. And what does that involve? Oh, it's going to involve a lot. It's going to take um, video images and putting them, feeding them into the computer, uh -huh. and using some of my own computer graphics, putting them together, and then putting audio for both of them. And <laughs> the the difficulty is um, trying to get all these things to talk to each other and wow. work. Uh, that is so exciting. I, yeah. 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 It It is. That's great. Yeah. You don't look so happy. What's going on? Oh, well. Uh-oh. No, it's exciting, but uh -huh. Yeah, uh, it. I just don't want to be away from home for those two days. What's going to happen in two days? Well, I just, I just don't want to be away from my kids if they need me. I'm not going to be there. Okay. Kids have the phone number. 
Yeah, I mean, I can give them the phone number. Mm -hmm. I know they can get in touch with me. That's not the issue. It's the issue of being not there. I mean, what if they need me? What if they need you? They can call you. They're not babies. No, but... Now, let's look at this. This is going to be on days. Can you arrange it? Like, I know Abby's got all kinds of after-school activities. Justin has all kinds of after-school activities. Can you arrange this, these two days that you'd be away so that the children wouldn't be alone? They would be with other um, children their age? Well, I, they want me to work on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And Tuesdays is when Abby has her gymnastics. Mm -hmm. And and Justin has his, he's got after school activities, he's got track. Okay, so Tuesdays you could arrange to be home just about the time they would get home? Yeah, I would probably get home shortly thereafter. Um, okay, so now we're down to one day. Thursday, well, Abby, Abby, I know she could spend time at a friend's house. I just hate having her do that, but... Sarah, something else sounds like it's going on here. What, I mean, what are you really feeling inside about those children? And not being there? My mother was never home for when, for me. And Sarah's reluctance to be away from her children and her anger at her own mother for leaving her alone when she was a child have come up a number of times already and we dealt with it in relation to the immediate situation. Now I think she's ready to look at the underlying dynamics. I, I swore I would never do that to my kids. Okay, let's, let's stop for a minute. Let's talk a little bit about you as a kid. You know, we haven't spent a lot of time doing that. Let's, let's look at that. Can you kind of get yourself into a mindset and think about when you were a little kid and think about a time when you were home when your mother wasn't there? Almost every time after school. Every day? She, she worked at the store mm -hmm. and she was not there for several hours and uh, all night on Thursdays she was at the store. Okay. What was it like for you? Can you can you get back to the feelings about being a kid and coming home from school? Was it an empty house when you came home? Well, both my brother and I got home around the same time. Okay. Was anybody home? Not at first. Okay. No. I would have to take care of getting things ready for dinner and, and making sure the house was cleaned up and... <sighs> My uncle was there on Thursdays, and I was expected to make sure that he was taken care of and fed. My aunt also worked late on uh -huh. Thursdays. Both she and my mother worked late on Thursdays. So, so once a week he was there? Yeah. Uh -huh. Your face is changing. Are you remembering something? Well, I just... Right, stop for a minute. I want you to... Put yourself back there. Can you make yourself like a little girl again? Just kind of <laughs> think, think little girl for a minute, okay? <laughs> and I just want you to close your eyes maybe and think about being little Sarah coming into the house. You come into the house with your brother and it's all empty in the house. You got that picture? Because some courts have ruled that hypnosis may produce unreliable information, it's preferable to use guided imagery when the legal implications are not yet clear. How are you feeling? I feel... I feel resentful. Mm -hmm. Did you get angry? Yeah. yeah. Could you show anybody how angry you were? No. No. You couldn't show no. anyone? No. I would just do things. No, I didn't show anybody. I was... 
You get no curled up in a ball. What are you? What are you thinking? I just was very f scared. <laughs> mm -hmm. Are you feeling scared now? Yeah. Can you attach that feeling of being scared to anything that's going through your mind right now? Sometimes when it was late and my mom hadn't been home, I'd lock myself up in my room to just get away from everybody and sort of expect my uncle to take care of things for my brother and sister and my dad would get really mad. Your dad would get mad because you'd lock yourself in your room? Yeah. And that was when just your uncle was there? Yeah. Are you seeing anything in your mind right now? I just remember being lying on my bed with my pillow over my head. You feeling scared? Yeah. Angry? Yeah, mostly scared. Mm -hmm. Mostly scared. You want your mother? Research shows that half of all battered women were sexually abused as children. Yeah, I... Did you ever tell her? That I was scared? And that you wanted her at those times? Or were you not allowed to talk about that? I, it never was right to talk about it. I. I told her that I w wished she was home, mm -hmm. but she... So you had, as a little girl, you had to fend for yourself. You had to do everything for yourself. Did you feel unprotected? Yeah, I did. Every night. Or especially the nights your uncle was there because it's often difficult to access incest memories, it's important to continue asking questions. It was especially on Thursday night. Dad didn't get home until around six or seven. I want to ask you something, Sarah. Do you think there's any chance or do you have any memories of your uncle maybe touching you in ways that made you feel bad? I... No, I, 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 I don't have any memories of that. I don't remember. Okay, it's just something I wondered about. The therapist must be very careful not to plant any false memories in the process. Even though Sarah is very compliant, it's interesting to note that she won't report something she doesn't remember. I feel like if she had been at home, then they would have never gotten divorced. They would have stayed together. That I wouldn't have had all that kind of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So it's your mom's fault? Well... But you just don't want to be like her? I don't want to be like her. I don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. I don't want that to happen to my kids. Mm -hmm. I, Let me ask you a question. You tell me all the time that you and your kids talk to each other. Do you talk more to your kids? than you and your mother were able to talk at that age? I think so. I try. I try really hard to do that. And when things aren't going right, the kids come to you and tell you? Most of the time. I know Abby had a lot of trouble when you first started coming to therapy, <laughs> but we've been talking a lot about it, and it feels like she's better now. Well, I think she is. I think... I think she is for the most part. I know that... that if something bad was happening to Abby, do you think she'd come and tell you? I'll challenge Sarah's earlier irrational beliefs by gathering evidence that her current situation is not the same as when she was a child.
but what I want to tie together and help you take a look at is that maybe part of your reluctance to leave home, especially on Thursdays, there's something about Thursdays, um, Sarah, that just doesn't feel like you can, anybody can be protected on Thursdays, that that may be tied more to you as a little child than to your children's needs. Hard that could be, huh? yeah, that, that could be. Hard stuff, huh? But good work. Yes? I've got a Dr. Adams on the line. He's in the emergency room at Metropolitan General. He's got Sarah there. Oh, of no. course, I always feel terrible when I get a call like this, but my first priority is taking care of Sarah. I'm a member of a feminist therapy support group where I can deal with my own feelings when a client gets hurt. Oh no, is she hurt very badly? A therapist who does not specialize in this work may want to seek consultation with someone who has more experience working with an abused woman. Oh no, her ribs too. Oh, this is not the first time, I'm afraid. Do you know what's happened to her? At times like this, I wish I could simply make a client leave an abusive partner. Oh, Unfortunately, serious. I can't make her leave. Besides, uh -huh. leaving does not stop the violence. Well, I'm not sure that we really, uh, does she want to be admitted? Uh, no, she's... no, no, I said I didn't want the police. You want to call the police? I hear her in the background. Yeah. Um, okay, if you want me to speak with her, I'd be glad to. Sarah. Hi, Sarah. I, I don't want the police called in. Does oh. he have to call the police in? No, he doesn't have, I don't think he has to call the police. But, it's tempting but, to team up with Dr. Uh, Adams to call the police, even though Sarah doesn't want it now. I know that there can be serious consequences later on. But again, Sarah must be empowered to make her own decisions, right or wrong. But I want to know, where's Dan? So you think he's gone? He's not going to be back? No, I don't think he's going to be back. Uh-huh. And where are the kids? Well, they're, they're with my sister. They're at your sister's house? Yes. Does your sister know what's happened? Have you spoken with her? No, I haven't, I haven't called her yet, but I, I'll give her a call. And I'll, I'll ask her to keep the kids tonight. Mm -hmm. And what are you going to do? No, Sarah, I don't think it's a good idea for you to come over um, to my place. Do you need to be with you, though? Well, if you really want to see me tonight, I've got one more client, and I could stay so you could come here, and we could have a session if you want. It's important to maintain appropriate boundaries throughout the therapy, especially at times like this. I want to make myself as available as possible for Sarah while still respecting right? the proper therapeutic alone? limits. You sure you want to stay alone? You don't want to go to your sister's? No, I, do, I don't want my kids to see me like this right now. Uh-huh. Can you call your sister and at least have her look in on you or call you? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure she would. Okay. Now listen, I'm going to be at home tonight. So if you need anything, I want you to call me, okay? Okay. Maybe just give me a call to check in. You have my home number? Yeah, yeah I do. All right. Um, let me talk to Dr. Adams, okay? And you know what? I want to see you in the morning. Can you come in at 10 in the morning? Yeah. Okay. You can do that? Yeah. All right. Listen, you take care. You're safe now, Sarah. You did a good job. You got yourself to the hospital. Okay. I want you to rest tonight. Call me if you need anything, and I'll see you first thing in the morning. Okay. All right. Let me talk to Dr. Adams. All right. Okay. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Lenora. How you doing? I feel, I feel awful. Wow, look at your arm. God, it still hurts. Oh. I really, oh, my ribs are really sore. Are they? Well, the doctor said you were pretty banged up. 
Yeah. What happened? <sighs> the day that my, my project was due, mm -hmm. I went to get it and Dan had deleted all of my files. He had permanently deleted them. I ran a check on them. I couldn't retrieve them at all. There was nothing there. I was so angry. I was so mad. I mean, how dare he do that to me? How, I had worked so hard. I had worked so hard on all of that. And he had he just he, he deleted everything that I had done. And when I when I confronted him with this, mm -hmm. he blew. When a batterer realizes he has lost his control over the woman, he will sometimes seek vengeance by destroying something she values. In Sarah's case, her competence at work was synonymous with her growing sense of self. And this is where Dan chose to attack her. Seen him, he threw me down the stairs, he kicked me. Wow. Oh, I'm so mad at him. Sounds like this is the worst he's ever done. Oh, he could have killed me. He could have killed me. I've never mm -hmm. seen that look in his eye. I've never seen him like that before. Never been. Oh, I have never been like this. I'm just so mad at him. Sounds like this time you really understand that there was nothing that you did, that this comes from inside Dan. I didn't do anything to deserve this. No, you didn't. Although there was no way to predict that Dan would beat Sarah so severely when she angrily confronted him, she was aware that her growing strength and independence was likely to...